One of the hardest things about understanding mammal responses to climate change is the fact that we don't know where these populations are. With plants, we can go out and observe them, count them, measure their distributions. With animals, we don't really know where they are because we can't go out and see them. They may be active at times of day when people aren't there. They're in places active at times when they simply aren't observed. Camera traps are a way to passively monitor the activity of animals. And so we can get surveys from camera trap data that allow us to look at these patterns across landscapes. Roland Kays is gonna take us out into the field with Rob and Haley. We'll come back after this video and relate some of those observations to the vignette for this unit. Hey everybody, I'm here again with Haley, and this time we're here with Roland to talk about how camera traps work, how you might turn these images into data, and then a little bit about sampling design. But first, let me introduce you to Roland. So we're gonna put a camera here. The only place in the world with wild red wolves in the Pocosin Swamp in North Carolina. My name is Roland Kays, and I've been running camera traps for a long time, all the way back from the days where they were film, and you were limited to only 36 exposures, and then the film would run out. Now, these digital cameras are amazing. Each camera can get thousands and thousands of pictures, and we're putting them out more and more across the landscape to learn about these animals and how they're doing in the environment, and we also get these fun pictures to look at. I actually first met Roland 13 years ago when he was down in Panama doing animal tracking. And believe it or not, sometimes we also do things like the science of unicycling. <laughs> His brain never stops moving. He usually never stops moving. You gotta kinda just keep up, and that's, that's part of the fun. The camera trap, motion sensor, flash, video camera. We're gonna see if we can get some of the bears and wolves that we saw stepped in that mud puddle not that long ago. Camera traps are great because they collect data on animals that are otherwise really shy, right? If you go for a walk in the woods, it's pretty hard to see a bobcat or a bear because they're hiding, they're probably sleeping during the daytime, and they hear you coming a long ways away and they run off. So these are animals that are otherwise really hard to sample, but if you put a camera out there, it just sits quietly for days, weeks, months at a time, and whenever an animal walks by, it grabs a picture. And that information, that basic information, that at this place, at this time, we had an animal, can be used to answer so many different research questions. I like camera traps because they do three things that I just really love. One is just getting out there in the woods and setting the cameras and picking the cameras up. That's a sense of adventure. You get to get out and have this little adventure in the woods. The second part is you get to actually see the animals. I love seeing animals and camera traps produce millions and millions of pictures of animals that I never get tired of looking at. And then third is as a scientist, they help me answer these scientific questions. They give me the data. The pictures become data and the data we can use to answer our scientific questions. And most recently, I've been teaming up with the Clark Lab to look at connections between the mammals that we get in our camera traps and the mammal food, what they like to call mast or the seeds that trees produce. Let's talk about how a camera trap works. So we've got a camera trap here. This is a motion sensitive camera. It's got the motion sensor here, the camera part here, and the infrared flash here. And so once we turn this on and strap it to a tree, anytime a warm-blooded animal walks by, it'll turn on and trigger and take a series of pictures. And if the animal's still there, it'll take more pictures. And those all get saved. Of course, on the inside, you've got the memory, you've got the batteries and the memory card. So you bring this memory card back. Always remember the memory card ID number so you can match it up with the GPS location for the site. And that's how you connect up ultimately the detections of all the animals that were right here with this GPS location. Whenever we set up camera traps, we have two main goals. One is we want to get as many different species as possible with the same set. And the other is we want it to be as representative and comparable across sites. So they're all set in the same way. And the way we do that is, first of all, we set them usually on a tree, if there's no trees around, on a stake, uh, about at knee height, right? So if you look, top of this camera is about at knee height. And what that allows us to do is to get almost all the, even the smaller species and the big species, right? So if a deer walks by, we're still gonna get it, even if it's close. Um, and it's also gonna get us, you know, if a skunk or a chipmunk comes by pretty low, we're still gonna get it. So that's the kind of, the reason we set it knee height. Some people will set them higher to only get um, bigger species, but we wanna get the whole community. Also, we have this parallel to the ground, right? So it's looking out over the area. Uh, it's relatively open. We don't have any vegetation, right? If we had a branch right down here, 
that was uh, blocking it, obviously it would block it. At nighttime, the flash would overexpose, it'd be a disaster. And if these branches get heated up in the daytime and blow around, it'll trigger it. So we clear out the area just within about a meter. Don't necessarily want to clear the whole thing. You don't want to make a destruction zone, right? And if there's some vegetation out there a few meters away, that's okay. The animals will still get detected by the camera trap. So the important thing to remember with these camera traps are that the motion sensor will trigger differently on big animals and small animals. It senses on moving heat. And so if you have a small animal that's really close, it'll probably trigger on it. It'll get a mouse and a chipmunk up this close. But once you're back further away, once you're back this far, three or four or five meters, maybe you'll get a mouse, maybe you won't. Once you go all the way back here, past the vegetation, you're never gonna get a mouse back here, right? But if a deer walks through, it'll still pick it up. So the point is that the area that a camera trap samples is only this area right in front. It's not the whole giant forest. It's this area right in front, and it's gonna get smaller animals cl uh, only closer, and bigger animals closer, but also further away. The other thing, if at all possible, we, like to, we don't use bait or lure, right? Because that could change your results. That could make your detection rates different because the animals are really hungry and they're coming for the bait. Or maybe a big black bear came in the first day and ate the bait, and then you didn't have the bait at this site, but you did have it at another site. And there's lots of studies now that are, are getting into the details, and we're learning that bait can have all kinds of different results, and lure, there's all kinds of different scent lure. You can get thousands of different weird, stinky things that you can put in front of a camera trap. Some animals are going to like it, and they're going to be attracted to it. Other animals are going to be afraid of it, and they're going to avoid it. So generally, I don't like to use it, although there are exceptions, right? If you're studying a really rare species that is really hard to get in camera trap, like wolverines. You pretty much need to use some bait and, and, and or lure to bring in a wolverine and get the picture. So there are some exceptions, but for these all-purpose kind of general animal community camera trap surveys, I really like to not use bait. Let's just get whatever's walking in front of this camera trap on camera. And here's how we turn images into data. So what we got here is a memory card that we've just taken out of a camera trap, and we're gonna look and see what do we have and how do these pictures turn into data. Right, so we've got this first picture is me, it's the camera trapper. Um, and so that, that confirms the date and time that this camera was set, uh, which is really important because we need to know the total length that the camera was set as our measure of effort. And so the first picture is always a camera trapper, the last picture is always a camera trapper, so that's automatically recorded. So here's me walking, away, me and Mike walking away from the camera, and now you see the first picture uh, is um, of a gray squirrel. It's not a very good picture, there's the gray squirrel running down there we have the date and time. And you see we have five different pictures because the picture, the camera in this case is set to take multiple frames at once when, um, the ant, when it triggers. So there's the squirrel. Now we advance to the next one. Oh, it's another squirrel. Okay, he's still there. Now here, here's a black bear. Nice big black bear, look at that sucker. Putting on his fall weight, uh, getting ready for hibernation. And in this case, this bear hangs out in front for quite a while. So we've got a number of pictures of this bear. Um, and we don't want to literally count each frame, right? It's the same thing if you, if you have a camera trap that's running video, you don't want every single frame. You want to know that the bear was there and that it was there from this time period to this time period. So we call this a sequence. We group together all these images here into one sequence. Basically, we set a rule, anytime pictures are less than 60 seconds apart, they get combined into one sequence, and those sequences are the data that we use in our analyses. If we look at the spreadsheet, we get here's the squirrel. You can see the date and time that that squirrel was there, Skyaris carolinensis, and then next comes Ursus americanus. So this is an example of how every time an animal walks through the frame, we get a series of pictures, we stitch together into a sequence, and that becomes one detection, which is represented by one row of data. This is a cool visualization of camera trap data at a whole bunch of different arrays. This is from our Snapshot USA project, and you can see across the country we've got lots and lots of data from, you can see from Idaho, from Kansas, from Louisiana, and then if you look at this row of colored dots, that's showing over time from when they set their first camera to when they set their last camera, all the different species that were detected. So each color is a different species, and you can see how diverse these different areas are. Some have lots of green dots, some have lots of pink dots. Those are different kinds of species. And you can see how common they are. Some places have pretty sparse, not as many animals, and other places have a lot of data, uh, a lot of, indicating a whole bunch of activity. And so this is kind of a fun representation of the rows of data that you see in Excel, only instead it's a bunch of colored dots. 
And here's how we decide exactly where to put the cameras and how many to run. So I'm gonna talk about study design now. How do you decide how many cameras to put out, how to arrange them, and how to make your comparisons between them? Once you get to a study area, you say, okay, I wanna know the animals in this study area. One camera's not gonna do it because you might have a spot that's really good or is really terrible for mammals, right? So you need to get, just like any ecological sampling, a representative sample. You need to get multiple cameras out there, typically a few dozen, maybe up to 50 sites that you've run cameras. Um, and you want to have those points be random because you don't want to go out and just pick the best places because then you're not getting a representative sample. And also because uh, you could have somebody that's really good at picking sites and someone that's really bad at picking sites. So you want to have it randomized. You want to walk out to your GPS point, you say, here's my point, this is where I'm going to run the camera. You can do that either as you know, truly sort of a randomized design with a random number generator, or just by putting a grid out and saying, okay, we need to pick a site here and a site here and a site here and a site here um, to run the cameras. That's gonna get you a good spread on your sites. Sometimes when you're setting up your study design, you have a very specific question that you need to add an extra dimension to your study design by doing a stratified random design. You need to stratify your samples across some dimension in order for you to ask your research question. And I'll give you an example. We did a study where we wanted to know the effect of hunting and hiking on wildlife. So for the first thing we did was we picked half of our study areas were hunted and half of our study areas were not hunted. And so that allowed us to make that comparison. And then within each study area, we would set cameras on the trail, near the trail, and far from the trail so that we could see if animals were affected by the hikers. And so that let us make sure that we had a good sample of sites on, near, and far from trail at areas that were hunted, areas that were not hunted, so we could make all those comparisons with the data. And those were things that we had thought of ahead of time, had built into our study design, and then we set our camera traps out accordingly. So one of the things that we've been doing with the Clark Lab is sampling at neon sites and going in with camera traps to sample at a specific neon site with cameras, get the snapshot of what are the animal populations like at this site. And the amazing thing about working at neon, of course, is all the different data sets that are out there. So when you think about the environmental data sets that you want to compare with your animal data, that there's no place in the world richer than NEON. And so it gives us a lot of ways that we can, uh, can complement this analysis. We can take the seed data from the Clark Labs, we can take the habitat data and the weather data from the NEON Labs, add in our uh, large mammal camera trap data, and uh, start to have a whole rich set of questions that we can ask. One of the coolest camera trapping data sets I've ever been associated with is the Snapshot USA camera trap data set from all 50 states in the United States collected in 2019 by a huge set of collaborators, camera trappers, that are out setting camera trap arrays. We've got 110 camera trap arrays scattered around. Each one of those arrays has uh, many multiple cameras. So we've got over 1,500 cameras total. And this data set is available to compare the mammal communities across all habitat types across all development zone, zones. We've got cameras in downtown Detroit, out to suburban areas, out to rural and wild areas, and the data is all available for you to look for patterns in. And not only that, but actually right now, I'm picking up some cameras from Snapshot USA 2020. It's a good, sometimes it's a good day, sometimes it's a bad day. <laughs> and I'm climbing hills through brambles the whole time. We're hoping this will be an annual thing so that we could look not only for these spatial comparisons or these differences of show, uh, studying how the animal communities are different over the country, but we can also monitor over time and monitor their trends and just see how our animal uh, populations are doing every year. So I hope you'll take this background and try some of it yourself. Whether it's running a camera yourself to find out, you know, what are the animals running around in your neighborhood or whether it's taking the spreadsheet, diving into those data, and trying to find some discoveries on your own. The camera trap observations that Roland took us through in the field are being used by our group and others to combine with NEON data. So at NEON, we have pitfall traps of small mammal data. We have camera traps at the same sites. We're trying to put both of these types of data together to understand responses of animal species to climate change. Eastern wood rat is an example of a species that we know is in decline due to habitat degradation. We see this in the coastal plain, but we have a very poor information on its current distribution. The observations that come in through the iNaturalist 
uh, citizen science website are sporadic. They probably don't well represent the true range. The neon data on pitfall traps together with the camera traps are giving us a better idea of that so that we're starting to be able to model more accurately what the distribution is and how that could respond to climate change. Uh, in the vignette that goes with this video, we'll talk about how to obtain those data, how we're using them to address uh, questions of climate change. We hope this video has helped you to understand how the data are collected and how it can be applied to scientific questions.